I have a confession to make. I'm a very thrifty individual. In fact, rather than spending money, I tend to invest money. That means I, instead of spending to depletion, I invest to grow the money over time. Hi, I'm Justin Hitt with Sustainable Wealth Secrets. I want to share a little bit of background about this newsletter and resource that we have for high-income professionals and entrepreneurs. But it starts with my personal behavior. So over the years, I've interviewed hundreds of multimillionaires and high-income professionals who have gained sustainable wealth. Now, sustainable wealth is where you have a principal amount of money in the bank, in investments, in assets that cash flow. And the cash flow of that investment is a percentage more than your everyday expenses. So for example, if you have $2.3 million in the bank, you could spin off safely about $80,000 in income. If your living expenses are $50,000, then you've got $40,000 to reinvest and grow your underlying principal. That is sustainable wealth. Now, if your expenses are only $25,000 a year, then you don't need $2.3 million in assets. And in some cases, some clients, for example, have 30 or 40 rental properties and they're a real estate agent. They got 30 or 40 rental properties. And between their real estate income and their rental income, they are able to have more than their expenses. Now, ideally, sustainable wealth is from passive income because if you're talking about sustainability, if you were to get injured or you would have a medical issue and you couldn't work, the money would just keep coming in. So investments are good. Real estate is good. Uh, the uh, natural uh, you know, resources rights are good. Intellectual property is good. There's a big long list of things. But I didn't get to this point by being someone who spends every dollar they've got. The first and foremost thing that you must do in order to obtain sustainable wealth is really look at yourself. Give yourself a hard look in the mirror. Are you trying to keep up with the Joneses? Do you buy things because other people buy them? Do you buy stuff because it makes you feel good? Or do you strategically buy in order to increase your asset value? Now, I... uh, just to, to be clear, I've hired staffing. So I, I, my net was about 55K. I hired staffing to help augment my day. So I would focus on the high value activity while someone on staff would, would uh, focus on other activities. And I've spent up to 50% of my take home pay to hire administrative assistants, web developers, uh, editors, uh, housekeeper, uh, cook, um, you know, laundry services. People to mow the grass, people to dig holes in the yard, people to set up the garden, just like a whole big cast of characters who take on specific roles that match their expertise, allowing me to have additional free time to go off and do other things. Now, I've always been aggressive about my income targets. So when I was 19 years old, making $98,000 a year, actually, I was probably uh, 20 something making $98,000 a year. When I was 19 years old, I was running a business and that would have been more my gross value of the business. I was running a computer consultancy. I still drove for the next level. In fact, I went from $97 an hour as a billable rate, uh, knowing full well that the rest of the market was about $55 per hour to $397 an hour as my going rate. I ratcheted up my going rate as I had more people to do the other work. So when I was doing computer consulting, if they wanted me to look at the server, then it would be a certain amount of money. If they wanted one of my technicians to look at the server, it would be a different amount of money. And so I would ratchet up the income, meanwhile, spending only ten to $15,000 a year in total expenses, including housing, food, shelter, everything. Ever since uh, high school or so, or maybe middle school, I've gotten most of my clothes from thrift stores. I found that you can get good quality clothes at a thrift store. Now, I'm still going to go to a place and get a suit, uh, you know, a nice place and get a suit. Um, I'm going to go get my, uh, you know, my pants tailored. I'm going to get dress clothing. I I think I got like three tuxedos. Every tuxedo has been fitted to me. When I gain weight or lose weight, I get it resized. Uh, But ultimately, um, my everyday play clothes 
if I go hiking, I'm not wearing a pair of $40 jeans. I'm wearing a pair of $5 jeans and I'm taking good care of them so that they last longer. So rather than spending to deplete, I'm uh, investing those money. I'm saying, look, I could, I could pay $40 for a pair of jeans or once or twice a year, I can go out and buy the clothing that I need uh, after going through the clothes that I have to uh, size them and make sure everything fits the way it's supposed to. Now, I'm not advocating you being a spendthrift and being a penny-pinching miser because there's a certain lifestyle element. There will be areas in your living that you you want you enjoy spending and uh, investing, uh, but there's no upside. Like when I was a kid buying comic books, um, there's really no upside in the comic books other than the enjoyment of reading them. And then maybe you find one or two that will, that will you know be worth ten dollars. Uh, but ultimately. The way you approach your everyday spending in small dollars impacts the way you're able to retain big dollars. So if you're giving to charity and one of your tenants is, uh, we talked about the wealth account and the, um, the charitable giving account, and you... You know, you're going to put 10% in the wealth account and 10% in the charitable giving account and you made 20 bucks and you don't take that portion and allocate it properly, then what are you going to do when you get $200,000? What are you going to do when you get $100,000? See, a lot of times when I teach clients how to get big money in big chunks, they get the big chunk and then they don't do what they're supposed to do with it. They get a big chunk and they say, well, you're not going to buy that boat. I was like, well, did you need the boat when you didn't have the money? And they're like, no, not really, but it'd be nice to have a boat. And now you got this big chunk, so you might, no. Uh, I've I've been working contract situations where I made $100,000 in six months, but it could be three months to another six months before the next contract comes along. I've been in situations where, um, as a, in selling, as a selling professional where you have a couple of slow months, there, there'd be the winter season when nobody's buying for some reason and you're unable to get contracts rolling over and you're on a draw. And then next thing you know, the weather starts warming up and you're selling like crazy and you don't know what hits you. The point I'm making here is, is the income that you receive isn't what you get to spend. There's allocations to your wealth account, your charitable giving account, your emergency fund account, your retirement account, and all the other ways that you pay yourself first. There's debt reduction strategies and how you manage that debt. Do you consolidate your loans to get lower interest rates at a shorter term and pay the higher payments now so that you can have more cash flow later? Or do you spread everything out over longer terms at higher rates because you're not really paying the the principal on that. Somebody else is paying it like a mortgage. So that's the difference between a 30-year mortgage on a rental property versus paying a rental property in cash. You can take the 30-year mortgage on the rental to gain access and control the property, and then the cash flow of the rental pays the mortgage itself. So you're really not out of pocket at all. And then you still have a cash reserve for maintenance and repairs. This is something that you've got to really sit down and critically think about. This is something that you've got to be comfortable with because there are the majority who spends every dollar they have and much more. They go into debt for cars. They go into debt for clothing in some cases. They go into debt for food when in fact you don't need to. I enjoy gardening. It's one of my hobbies and I grow almost 60% of my vegetables during the growing season. Now, I'd like to do that year round, but we get a pretty cold winter and I don't have a greenhouse. And so maybe I might invest in a greenhouse if I want to grow vegetables throughout the winter. But right now, during the spring, uh, summer, and fall, I grow a vast majority of vegetables that I enjoy. So I get fresh organic food and I get it right out of my backyard. It saves me the carbon miles from driving to the grocery store. I get better quality food and a wider variety of food, and I get it at less than premium prices. Now, you might be saying, well, Justin, you've got to go out there and garden. Well, I enjoy gardening. Maybe for you, it's golf. Maybe you enjoy golf, and you don't see any way to make more money off of golf because you're really not that good, but you make a regular effort to uh, develop relationships through golf by either being a member of a country club or inviting friends out to play or connecting with friends and in, in, in playing as part of a, the business development side. There are various aspects to consider, but I would always recommend, and I recommend this to my kid, 
I, and, and I've always heard this. So I've done these hundreds of interviews with multimillionaires, uh, some people that are extremely wealthy, and they've always said, spend half. So you're going to set aside your wealth account, your charitable giving account, your emergency fund, cash reserves for, for large expenses in the future, your retirement account, your investment account. You're going to do all that and you're going to end up with likely less than 50% of your net check because you're going to also have a tax reserve account um, that you have like pennies left over. The thing is, is if you spend based on the pennies left over, You've taken care of all the important stuff. Remember, sustainable wealth is enough principal assets that cash flow greater than your expenses. So if you forced yourself when you're making $10,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year, you forced yourself to live off of a very tiny amount of that money. And again, you're not really restricting lifestyle. I like quality organic food. I like, uh, you go out to the restaurants periodically, but I tend to go to farm to table restaurants. I tend to go to little mom and pop places where I both get good food and there's a social aspect. Um, but I get a a large volume of vegetables in the garden. Some of it I preserve, some of it I, I ferment. Um, and then, so I have some of those vegetables over the winter, um, I'm not impacting my lifestyle doing that. I enjoy that. I casual, I'm a casual gardener. I, I, I work on gardening methods that don't require a lot of inputs. Um, but ultimately what is it for you? It could be a a part of a food co-op. When I was, uh, running my computer consultancy business, I was actually a member of a a regional food co-op and I'd volunteer a couple hours and I'd leave with way more in grocery value than the time value invested in, in the volunteering. Plus it was a great social experience, uh, dinner clubs, for example, uh, as far as shelter is concerned, choose a home that is a moderate size. Now, a lot of folks get these big McMansions and they like to show everybody how big their dick is. I mean, excuse me, how big their house is. Um, but you don't have to do that because a small, modest home, you could pay cash for a lot of times. Um, where I live here in Martinsville, Virginia for $75,000, you can get a nice home on two acres, um, in, in a, you know, far enough away from your neighbors. So if your neighbors have trailers in their front yard or cars up on blocks, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but for $150,000, you can get a 3000 square foot house in the middle of a nice, uh, classic neighborhood, uh, right up from the lake. The, the point I'm making is, is just because you can afford a 300 or $400,000 house or a $500,000 house doesn't mean it's going to be a good investment. And I know I've gone through a couple of videos where we've driven through some of these immaculate, beautiful neighborhoods, half million dollar homes, new construction. And next thing you see is, uh, the next neighborhood over, which was last year's new construction. All the houses are down to 300,000. So the original owner bought it for 500 and then the area gets overbuilt and then the houses go down to 300 and you're now sitting in a house that's underwater. Now, I also show how there are many smaller homes, older homes nearby that need minimal maintenance. They need minimal, uh, you know, updates in order to be just as comfortable as the larger home. They're usually sitting on more land and they're going for a hundred thousand. They're going for 150,000. So you could have the same locality because a lot of people will say, you know, I, I got this house because of the locality is close to the kids' schools. You can always find another house in the same school district that doesn't cost $500,000. Now, sure, you might want to be a member of the club, but you don't have to live in the neighborhood to do so. You can live in the, in the near uh, vicinity. More importantly, is that we aren't just earning for today. Because a lot of folks say, you know, Justin, all you care about is money and you're greedy and you're constantly trying to get paid more. And how could you get more? And no, no, I'm not just providing for my family. I'm not just providing for me today. I'm also providing for my future self. And so are you. So every dollar you earn, scrape off the top and pay yourself first. Pay yourself into reserve accounts so that you have the money working for you and spinning off interest to start building sustainable wealth. Don't wait till you have a higher income. If you already have a, an average income, you can start today. Start getting into the habit of a little bit of thrift. 
Uh, I know America has had prosperity for so long, and this is an easier message for my European or my um, my Chinese listeners. Um, but that making do with what you've got and making the best out of what you have, that is a practice for building wealth. I've uh, interviewed farmers that had problems like their local bank calling them and saying you can't keep $500,000 in a checking account. And they already had several million dollars in investment accounts and they just like to keep the $500,000 in the checking and savings account in order to just I don't really understand why he had that much money in a checking and savings account. But but basically he was thinking about buying some property and he was going to just cut a check for the property. Long story short, this 65 year old man had way more money than he needed. But over his life, he lived like he never had enough. And it's not a not having enough as a desire or want. It's an understanding that we need a security blanket. We need a a fallback. We need to have a cushion should economic changes happen, should other uh, environmental changes happen, should we be underinsured for some reason. Um, and then also when you have a lot of cash, you can buy better. So in the case of this 500000 he had, he was looking at a property that was about a million dollars. And what he figured is nobody's going to turn down uh, it was a scrub property connected to his own property. Nobody's going to turn down five hundred thousand in cash for property today, versus uh, you know potentially waiting on financing. Uh, and I think they were going to work out some other type of lease back deal. It was way more complex complex than my mind could understand at the time. But I do cover some of those strategies and getting paid now. And then I have another program about how to. Uh, have things by its by themselves. So I told the story about buying my truck. It actually paid for itself on the purchase. Um, not only because I require acquired a it's a temporary asset. Uh, I acquired an asset at under its resale value, but also the immediate use of the vehicle generated enough revenue uh, and, and cost avoidance in order to just cover the cost in the first place. So it was equivalent of me buying a used vehicle. I'm not advocating that you got to go out and buy a used vehicle and you got to drive around an old beater. Um, I'm, I'm ad, you know, cause I got a brand new truck. I'm advocating that you, you, you do the homework up front to make sure things pay for themselves. So let me quickly summarize while I am thrifty and I reuse jar, I put seeds in, you know, they talk about single use plastics and jars. I get a glass jar and I clean it out after I'm done using it. And then I put seeds in it and then I put it on my little seed shelf and that jar gets used a bunch of times rather than thrown in the trash. I do recycling. I, um, I am, uh, mindful of how I purchase so that I, re uh, produce the smallest amount of waste. That's what you want to do with your income. Be mindful about how you use your income so that you can accumulate assets that cash flow and you have the least amount of waste. I'm Justin Hitt with Sustainable Wealth Secrets. If you have questions about this or any other program, you can visit us at www.sustainablewealthsecrets.com. I want you to look over your income and your expenses and see how you can you can sift off more of that income into assets that cash flow into reserve accounts into uh, planning so you can pay cash for more things and um, reducing that debt or at least strategically aligning that debt so you have control over assets that cash flow if you need help with this you're going to talk with your your accountant or your CPA or your fee-based certified financial planner. If you have questions or want to talk about strategy, uh, then you can contact me about a paid consultation at www.sustainablewealthsecrets.com. Thanks for listening. I'm here for high-income professionals and entrepreneurs who want to build wealth that outlives them and their family and provides for them whether or not they can work. Thanks for listening.